Hi everyone, so it's gonna be time to talk about the Kernel Transaction Manager. So quickly, we're gonna actually use the abbreviation KTM instead of Kernel Transaction Manager. So yeah, we're gonna start by looking at different things in the next few videos. The first thing we're gonna look at is just from a high level perspective, detailing what is KTM, what are the different objects. Then in the next few videos, we'll look into the actual KTM objects in the kernel. What are the different fields, how they interact with each other. And a future video will be about all the KTM states, which are basically the states corresponding to different KTM objects, how they evolve over time, how they behave. Okay, let's get started. So here, we will basically assume you don't know anything about the kernel transaction manager and that you started reverse engineering the patch by using binary diffing. So the idea is you want to do the best you can with the little knowledge you have. But when you look at a big function like this TM recover resource manager X, you don't really know what a resource manager is. You don't know what recovering a resource manager means. You don't really know what any of the kernel structures related to the transaction manager are. So the approach you want to take is often the same as when reversing stuff, which is that you may as well know as much as possible about the actual component. And so I said in a previous video that generally you don't want to learn all the Windows internals because it's time consuming. But here is an exception and it's actually a counter example because we don't know anything about the current transaction manager at that time. So basically you want to just read what a bunch of the structures look like and what the standard APIs to talk to the KTM driver are. And the idea is to get an intuition about what we need to know to make reversing a bit easier. Because if we were blindly documenting the vulnerable function by improving the decompiler output and were able to understand what the vulnerability is, it is still not going to make a lot of sense how to exploit it because we don't know anything about the actual context around that function. So there is this, this type of exploration into the component we are targeting. In this case, the KTM driver just provides a lot of value from multiple, multiple angles. So it's interesting insofar as like KTM itself isn't actually that relevant to most kind of exploitation research, but it is really useful insofar as there isn't much documentation on it online. So it is really a good opportunity to show the approach to just look into something that nobody else has looked at and how you end up integrating other bits of research into it as you need. So if you look up online about KTM, you'll find a bunch of resources. So you can find there is a portal on MSDN with a fair bit of information. But if you're not used to the actual kernel transaction manager component in general, a lot of it is kind of confusing. There is a lot of new terminology. A lot of the stuff is kind of misleading or hard to read, but it's still nice that there is any documentation at all. And so you can find some very useful videos from the Windows Vista era, which is when they introduced KTM into the Windows kernel. And I think they were really excited that everyone would end up using it. So they wanted to document it. And at the end, nobody used it. And so normally this is just a phase which is kind of boring depending on how interesting the component is, but you just end up having to read a lot of stuff. And so in our case, we find that despite there is this MSDN portal, there is no sample code on, on the MSDN. And also there is, we can't find any sample code online either of other people using the KTM component because it seems basically nobody uses this feature. React OS doesn't have any code related to it because it was based on Windows NT. There was some leaked Windows source code, but it was also too old to have KTM related code. So this is the case where basically you have to do reversing and we have to implement all our own little code samples from scratch to experiment with the APIs. And the idea is that when we exploit the bug later, we are probably going to want to know how the APIs work anyway, because we are going to have to potentially build up all these states into the KTM component. So building up just a whole bunch of code samples that we can play with for fun 
and just see how things work is just a general good way for us to improve our knowledge on the components, but still it will allow us to have it handy later during exploitation. And so this is very iterative in that you need to read a bunch of stuff. You get a rough idea of basic functionality. You implement some APIs. You spend a bunch of time debugging because you screwed it up and it doesn't work. Maybe you reverse some of the things related to the APIs because the documentation is incomplete. And then you get it working and you just rinse and repeat this process until you build up a good, decent mental model of what things are. So what we detail in that following slides is a bit cheating because we are going to present KTM internals as our final understanding. So it, it is easier and faster for you to approach things. And so if you have some time now to spend, I would recommend you try reading and watching all these resources beforehand. So you actually realize what it is to be in that situation where you don't know anything and you have to learn everything from the available resources. And then obviously you can continue watching this, this slide deck. So what is KTM? So basically KTM is just some kernel service that was added in Windows Vista. And it was originally part of NTOS kernel, but then later it was moved to its own driver called tm.sys. And this is mostly relevant for when you are reversing things or diffing. Sometimes it is actually good to reverse engineer several versions. For instance, you can diff it on Windows Vista, Windows 7 or, or Windows 10. And so knowing where the code is, is actually useful since you might need to switch between different Windows versions. In some case, doing things like diffing, it is actually easier to use something like Diaphora or Bindiff on a smaller file like tm.sys than ntoskernel.exe. Because if they fix some other vulnerabilities or added new features, say as part of the same monthly released update, it could be that NTOS kernel had like numerous other changes. So Diaphora or Bindiff would match them all. Whereas if it is tm.sys and there is only one KT vulnerability fixed, then you pretty much know that the changes will be interesting to look at. And basically the idea of this transaction manager is to provide what they call ACID functionality. So it is basically operations which they call atomic, consistent, isolated, and durable. And so the idea is you have some work that needs to be done and that work will be fairly complicated. And so every piece of that work will sort of all be done in a way that either it all actually happens and it is committed, which means every part of it is sort of finished, or if any part of the work fails, the whole thing is reverted as, it, as if it never happened. And so the APIs are quite confusing. And this could be one of the reasons why nobody ended up using it. And so Microsoft themselves use it for the registry and NTFS. So you could actually sort of reverse NTFS drivers and see references to the KTM kernel functions called directly from other parts of the kernel. But from our perspective, this is not the best approach because we want to be able to talk to the KTM service from Uselan by calling syscalls since our goal is to exploit a bug for local privilege escalation. So it is, it is a lot simpler to look at the Uselan exposed APIs related to KTM and analyze the code of the corresponding syscall implemented in kernel. And really, it just boils down to a few dozen APIs and system calls exposed to userland that you need to spend time playing around with. And it ends up being a lot of trial and error through development in general. But this is actually expected. If you're actually doing research on an unknown component, you will spend time doing this kind of thing. The whole idea of a transaction is that it is an atomic operation that is made up of a ton of workers and, and parts. An example that is easy enough if you're familiar with is an SQL database where the concept of transaction is generally used. The example I think that Microsoft uses is something like an, an ATM, an automated teller machine, 
where you are transferring money from one bank account to another bank account. And so for obvious reasons, when you have money removed from one person's bank account, you want to make sure the receiving bank account has actually received the money. And vice versa, if the receiving bank account has received the money, you want to make sure the source bank account was debited accordingly. So the whole process would be a transaction. And if one part fails, the whole bank transfer will be reverted. Another example from our perspective in the Windows environment is something like an installer. The installation process of a new software is going to involve writing maybe a few hundred files, making registry, modification, adding services, etc. And all of this stuff will be part of a single transaction. And that transaction is the installation. And so if any part of it fails, the entire installation is just reverted. And so I think that that is why KTM was developed originally, because Microsoft thought it would be very useful for many other parts of Windows. There are three sort of high level states that a transaction can go through. The first one is the committing of the transaction itself, which is sort of saying, okay, this is, this is work we want to do. I am now committing to it. And in the process of committing to it, you go through a series of underlying state changes with the end result being that the transaction is completed, like an, an actual installation of a software happened. If any of them fails, the big operation that happens is called the rollback, which basically reverts everything that happened and you go back to the very beginning state. And finally, the recovery is something where some error might have occurred during the operation, like say you needed to write a bunch of files to disk and the file system temporarily went down, but then it came back up. That's the type of scenario where you might be able to keep the transaction going. And so these types of states are recoverable because you can basically recover a transaction so that although there was a bump in the road, you can keep installing and maybe what you committed to do can actually happen and be completed. What is funny is that even though KTM is interesting and complicated, not a lot of people have really looked at this service in general. Most people that looked at it and published vulnerabilities publicly are actually people working at Project Zero at the time of this recording. And in 2018, there was this blog by Kaspersky where they documented a zero day exploited in the wild, where they don't get much technical details. And this is the bug we are going to exploit in this training. And then in 2019, some malware was using the KTM APIs as an obfuscation mechanism to basically do file system transactions without calling the file system APIs directly, but instead doing it indirectly through transaction related APIs. Since we made this research and prepared that course, there has been several presentations around KTM and more specifically the vulnerability we're going to target in this course, both by Kaspersky who discovered the exploit in the wild and NCC group who I am currently working for. So originally Kaspersky almost didn't give any technical detail or information as all they did was releasing a blog with two paragraphs about high level view of how the export was working, which we'll read a bit later in the course. And you'll see it's not super helpful to actually export the vulnerability. In parallel, my great colleague Aaron and I worked on writing an export for the same vulnerability. And interestingly, we came up with different techniques to exploit the bug than what Kaspersky described seeing in the wild. We actually found way later that a talk was given in 2019 at Blue Hat, but we hadn't found it due to hard to find links and Google not referencing it well enough. And so at the end, both Kaspersky and us ended up giving talks at security conferences with more details. Kaspersky gave actually a bit more details, which can be useful to read, but they will be quite hard to understand until you actually work on the exploit yourself. Also, they never gave all the technical informations about the techniques being used by the in the wild exploit. So there are still some unknowns. Also, Kaspersky never shared a hash for the exploit they caught. So we can't actually reverse engineer that in the wild exploit to confirm any of the information or to understand the gaps. 
And to be honest, it is hard to understand all the details they published, even for us who have been developing a working export for the same variability. NCC Group did publish a lot of information on, on the exploitation techniques we used, and, and again, they are different from the individual export, apparently. That being said, I would not recommend going over all that material if you haven't done it yet, just for a couple of reasons. The first reason is that the whole point of this course is to actually go over the process of exploiting a vulnerability as if there was no content available. The second reason is that, sure, the contents would potentially help you, but it might also be misleading since what it presents is the actual results once you have finished your exploits, not the actual methodology to reach that goal, which is kind of what this course is about, right? Anyway, if you have read it already, don't worry, as there is a lot to learn in this course and going over the same concepts several times is always beneficial for your brain and your mental model. From a reversing perspective, there are sort of four main kind of structures that KTM is always dealing with. They are all referenced counted objects that are tracked by the object manager. And I'll go over each of them in more details later. But basically, from a high level view, there is the transaction manager, which just tracks all the transactions in general. Then typically the work that is going to be done as part of a transaction is associated with one or more different resource managers. And a resource, you can think of it maybe like the Windows registry or the NTFS file system or whatever. And when we say that, basically, when we say that, okay, I am committing to that transaction, if the transaction is about writing 10 files to the file system and writing 10 registry keys, the work related to the 10 files will be associated with the file system resource. And so there will be a resource manager that tracks that work. And the work related to the 10 registry keys will be associated with another resource manager dealing with registry keys. Then you have the transaction object. And finally, you have the enlistment. So the enlistment is basically a resource manager representing sort of a single piece of work associated with a transaction. And they sort of enlist in the transaction and say, I am going to do this work. So I am committing to collaborating with the other enlistments doing work for that same transaction. Basically, as can be seen in the Windows kernel in general, this figure just shows the general relationships between the different KTM structures in the kernel. So there is a slightly complicated object graph that is created inside the kernel with some interesting relationships. So we see this KTM, like underscore KTM, this could at first be confusing since it has the same name as the KTM component, but this KTM structure is the actual transaction manager object we just talked about. It is not tracking the entire KTM component stuff. There is one or more resource managers associated with the transaction manager, and they are tracked by the K resource manager structure. And a resource manager object has a linked list of enlistments and those, those enlistments may be involved in one transaction or more than one transaction because a resource manager tracks all the enlistments associated with the same resource and there might be multiple transactions happening at the same time. So this is kind of a high level view of how you can think about what KTM looks like at a given time in the kernel. But obviously, we'll go into more details about what the KTM structures are in the next videos.